They are the makers of the iconic Navitimer timepiece that became a pilot's best friend. Breitling is a household name in the Swiss luxury watch industry. The company is one of the last independent luxury watchmakers. With its star power and aviation roots, the firm is pushing its active livestock credentials through sports partnerships. And the Middle East is becoming more important for Swiss watch exports. With the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia ranking in the top 15 in 2018, Breitling launched special editions exclusive to the region, but it's Dubai that is the key location for the company. We sit down with the CEO of Breitling, George Kern, in Dubai. George, welcome to At The Top. Thank you very much for joining us. We've been really looking forward to it. Let's just start off then with you coming into the business. Breitling was mostly known as a brand that featured chunky timepieces favored by older men. Uh, you took steps to turn that around. Run me through what the priorities were for you. So indeed, um, the brand did age a little bit of the last uh, couple of years and indeed had that image of producing only aviation watches. We had the objective to modernize the brand because Brightling was always more than aviation. So we uh, reintroduced the areas uh, uh, land and sea in addition to air and reviewed basically everything. Our boutique concept, uh, which is now much more industrial style loft. Uh, we reviewed our advertising campaign uh, totally, where also women play a totally different role than in the previous campaigns at Breitling, and of course our products. And it's also coming with a change in the consumers that you target, right? So now you're casting a wider net. Asian consumers, now more of, of a goal, of a target? Yes, China is a very interesting case because I think the market pivoted over the last four or five years uh, because uh, millennials today or younger people don't want to buy the watches of their parents. And then you also cut down on the number of collections you have. I mean, this is a huge transformation in the Swiss watchmaking industry for a brand like Breitling. Uh, run me through what the strategy is now. I mean, now you're down to four, is that right? Yes, the, the point is um, too much choice is no choice. So um, having in our case, over 650 SKUs uh, or references is just too much, is confusing for the consumer, is confusing for the sales staff in the store. And uh, we have been working on that to, to have clear segments with clear storytelling uh, and clear identities. Breitling's roots and history runs deep in chronographs. I've been fascinated myself with chronographs ever since I was a young kid. For those who don't know what a chronograph is, how would you explain it? Well, it's a, it's a timekeeping uh, instrument. So you have basically uh, what we call simple automatic watches where you have 60 seconds, uh, um, 60 seconds hand, and then you have chronographs where you can time whatever you want. The, the family Breitling developed everything around the chronograph, and uh, we are famous as being one of the leaders in the chronograph segment. In 2017, you're the CEO already of a top watch company. You know Breitling is struggling and you get a call and they're pitching for you to take over the company and it comes with 800 million euros of private equity backing. What was your first reaction? I was intrigued because, um, you know, I was just promoted in another job at that time in, in a big corporation, the second largest uh, uh, luxury group in the world, and suddenly comes uh, somebody suggesting you to become an entrepreneur because private equity is one thing, but at the end of the day, I had the opportunity to co-invest in the company uh, alongside with CVC, uh, the private equity company, and alongside some of uh, the other managers at Brighting. Here's the thing, George, the private equity industry and the Swiss watch industry are almost polar opposites. One is about successful exits and cost control, and the other one is about having a long and rich tradition, taking your time. Can you even balance the two? It's not really the case. I mean, we invest so much money uh, in the relaunch of the brand, in building uh, content, brand equity, um, and uh, 
it is a real pleasure to work with, uh, with, with investors who have um, such a view on building brands. Writing was always successful, but we want to make it more successful. But of course, the business model is as it is, and at a certain stage, uh, we will sell this company for sure. So at this stage, you don't feel any particular pressure from your, from your bosses? Um, no, because I presented a growth plan and not a cost-cutting plan. And this was, for me, one of the key points why I also joined uh, Brighting. Uh, it, it was not about cost-cutting, but it was about developing the brands, going into new segments, going into China, going back into the female segment, growing the brand, uh, building the brand, and investing in the equity of the brand. This was quite a journey for you as well, because you came from this mega group right, Rishmo, and you switch to an independent watchmaker like Breitling. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned from that process? You, you know, I was always more a front man. Um, uh, I like to do the stuff myself, um, being involved uh, really in, in, in the implementation of things. And from a, um, I would say I'm, I'm certainly more a manager than an administrator. So having that entrepreneurial challenge was something uh, very interesting. And actually, I didn't hesitate uh, so long to, to accept the offer. Was it difficult? It was difficult. Uh, I think it was very difficult for my wife, <laughs> but uh, much less for me. And the people from the exterior didn't understand how you can move from such a big corporation into a relatively small company. My friends understood because uh, they know me, they know my character, and they totally understand why I did that. Strategy Analytics points to data that shows that 45 million smartwatches were sold in 2018. I'm looking at the number here. That's more than the combined number of wristwatches and timepieces exported by the entire Swiss watch industry. What can you do to make sure that the mechanical timepiece, like the ones that Breitling does, remains relevant in this digital age? I'm not worried at all about uh, digital watches. Actually, I believe they're complementary. Uh, I think they have total different objectives. An analog watch is much more emotional, tells a story, has an aesthetic, uh, is long lasting. You can you know, give it to the next generation. A digital watch is something you have to throw away after a couple of months because it's outdated. Let's say we're in the beverage market. If you take Coca-Cola and the Chateau Lafitte, these are total different beverages. We are the Chateau Lafitte, the analog watches, and the digital watches are Coca-Cola, and that's the difference. But it's changed how you approach as well, the industry, because you're trying to take ideas from the smart watches and see where you can implement them. Potentially in the straps themselves, is that something that you're looking at, that you have the, the, you know, the smartness in, in your, on your wrist, Indeed, but not in the mechanical we, type? We have also electronic watches, but as we are pilot's watch, these are, I would say, professional tools. So for instance, we have this famous emergency where if you are in danger or lost or uh, whatever, you know, we, we send the signals to the satellites and, and an organization, depending on the country where you're in, is, is coming to save you. But these are professional tools. I don't think that at Brighton we want to go into uh, the typical uh, digital watches as they exist uh, in, in, uh, with other brands. Why does somebody need a mechanical timepiece with a price tag like the ones that Breitling produces? Because in the past, you've described this as an irrational decision. This it is an purchase. irrational yeah. decision. And thank God, humankind is irrational. It's about beauty. It's about feeling. It's about lifestyle. It's about an emotion. It's about identification. Uh, many, many non-rational uh, um, uh, elements, and I think in this digital age, we even have a bigger future with analog watches because there's an overkill of digital. And for sure, nobody's buying a watch, an analog watch, to read time. You're surrounded by so many digital tools and information that it's good also to come back to analog uh, products rooted in the past where there's craftsmanship. After the break, why Dubai is a key market for Breitling and how the Emirates burgeoning tourist industry makes it such an important hub for luxury brands. Is it going to be the Chinese or the locals that, that's going to drive your growth? 
I mean, you cannot fight demography. I mean, China has 1.6 uh, billion you know, uh, population. You have 300 million uh, people traveling by 2020. But the trend is positive. But then you have ups and downs depending on the socio-economic political situation in the world. We'll talk about Dubai a little bit now. Uh, what are your first memories of the Emirate? Oh my God. I've been uh, traveling to the Emirates since 20 years, um, or 25 years. And of course, everything changed. I mean, the- I, mean, I can see you smiling. Why don't you share a story, an anecdote? I, I remember the, when I started to come here, first of all, there was no internet, no nothing. Uh, we had faxes. I I used to go to the Intercontinental in the in the old uh, in the old town. I remember my partners here picking me up, and and this was just the beginning of the beginning. And today, uh, every time I come back, I see a new building. Um, it's phenomenal, and 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 uh, and the business dramatically also improved over the last uh, years. I mean, let's pick up on that. Where does Dubai rank and the region? in Breitling's global portfolio? So the Middle East is probably uh, the, the fourth or the fifth region. It's an important market, but you have to distinguish between the local market and the tourist market. So Dubai in particular is also dependent on Chinese tourists, depending on the brands between 40 and 60%. And then you have the locals uh, and you have uh, uh, also the expats, which is also a, a different clientele. Um, and it's a very, I would say, mature market, I think, for luxury goods. And is it going to be the Chinese or the locals that, that's going to drive your growth here? I mean, you cannot fight demography. I mean, China has 1.6 billion you know, uh, population. You have 300 million uh, people traveling by 2020. Um, uh, the, the growth of the population in Dubai is obviously not growing as much. But we need to um, respond to both needs, to the local market, of course, and uh, to the tour, uh, tourist market. The Dubai government is pursuing aggressive expansion plans, and you've just described some of the transformations that you've seen in the last few years, but the scale of the expansion has weighed on property prices. Uh, you've also got regional geopolitical uncertainty. You've got oil price volatility. I mean, of, uh, when you look at these variables in an equation, which, which one of the three makes the biggest difference in, in sales? You know, a luxury good is not something you really need. What you need in the Maslow pyramid is your food, is your clothes. You have other needs, so mm -hmm. it comes last in your, in your, in the pyramid of your needs. Yeah. Um, so, in principle, what you need is a good and positive environment, and anything which disturbs that mood, be it the Brexit, be it instability with Iran, be it um, social crisis like in, in Hong Kong or whatsoever is not good for the luxury industry. And, and these are external factors uh, which counterbalance the demographics and positive trends we see, for instance, in India or in China or in many other areas in the world. The trend is positive, but then you have ups and downs depending on the socio-economic political situation in the world. Expo 2020 is coming up and the government plans to host 25 million tourists in the span of six months. How is Breitling looking to capitalize on this? We have to, to further develop our boutique net, network. Uh, we need to be in the best spots here in Dubai. There are new malls, new hotels opening um, uh, uh, constantly and we need to be in, in the best locations and we need to be present where um, and to reach our customer base. There is evidence now that luxury is becoming more globalized and that you don't have to cater as much to local preferences. What are you seeing in the Middle East in, 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 on that front? I totally agree. The customer in the Middle East, be it a local or an expat, is the same here as in Paris or in Italy or in the United States. The brands are also global uh, and we need to be a global brand. The consumer wants to recognize a brand also in the same way. So yes, you have local adaptations, but fundamentally 
uh, you need to have the same appearance, the same boutiques, the same service, the same quality all over the world. Allow me to flesh that out in a bit more detail. Is there a difference in how, for example, Saudi Arabia would uh, react to a particular model or Egypt or the United Arab Emirates? I mean, what are you seeing within the region a, in terms of preferences, but also in terms of demand? You might sell smaller sizes in, in, in Asia, or you might sell uh, different color dials in some other markets. But these are little differences and, and they are not material within the global uh, brand, I would say, offering. Coming up next on the program, from watchmaker to movie maker, how the CEO of Breitling has been turning his talents to the silver screen. And we also find out how the company is using an innovative approach to create recycled watch straps from fishing nets in order to play their part in cleaning up the world's ocean. If you weren't the CEO of a Swiss watch company today, what would you be doing? I would be in the movie business, most probably. Actually, I am because I just produced a movie in, in France. What are you doing as a business to promote diversity? Well, we have uh, dramatically changed um, our advertising campaign. For instance, we work now with what we call squads, so we don't have individualities in the campaigns. We don't have single people representing uh, our brand. We have what we call squads, so it's a team of three. For instance, our surfer squad, we have arguably the biggest surfer of all times, was Kelly Slater, but we have two phenomenal women, uh, also world champion, uh, being part of that squad, our cinema squad with Charlize Theron, alongside Brad Pitt and, uh, and Adam Driver. So we've just launched uh, a new aviation squad with one of the most amazing Spanish uh, uh, pilot, and she flew over 1,500 hours in an F-18, and she's a instructor for the uh, Spanish army. So this, for me, uh, represents uh, how we see women today in our society and how I think they see themselves. When I look at the Swiss watchmaking industry and I look at the CEOs, it's clear that most of them are men. Uh, why has the industry been so slow to change, George? We have a couple of female uh, CEOs which uh, were appointed over the last couple of years. Um, I think it's, it's, it's an evolution um, and, and we're trying to attract more women in our business, um, but you know, they must also apply. Until now, there are not enough women applying really for these jobs. Let's talk about sustainability as well, because you've committed to reducing aqua waste. I mean, how else are you looking to improve Breitling's footprint on that side? We always say that we want to do the maximum we can in our sphere of influence. We are a small, relatively small company. We cannot change the world. What we can do, though, through our 200 or 250,000 customers, um, we can educate, we can raise awareness, uh, we can talk about in an intelligent way. And, um, and indeed, our focus are the ocean. So we do support ocean conservancy, which is fighting plastics in the ocean. And we have a partnership with Kelly Slater's company called Autonone, and we've just launched um, Econeal straps made out of lost fishing nets. So it's nylon lost fishing nets. And you have to imagine there are 650,000 tons uh, of lost fishing nets wow. in the oceans. That's incredible. And, um, and the company we work with, they recycle this material and they uh, deliver not only us, but also Prada, Burberry, and other luxury brands. I'd like to talk about you for a minute. Uh, 14 year stint with IWC, your CEO there. I mean, in the Swiss watchmaking industry, that's pretty much like a divorce. How did you deal with that on a personal level? Of course, you're emotionally attached uh, to a brand you have been running for so long. But at the end of the day, you, you have to move uh, forward in life. And uh, when uh, when uh, I had that opportunity with Brighting, um, I said, okay, it's a dream. It's, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of private equity, to be 
uh, a co-investor uh, to build something uh, on such a great basis. Because as I said earlier, Brating it was at that time also a, a strong company. So uh, yes, when the train is passing, you have to jump on it. So how long did that train journey take? How, how much time passed from the moment you got the call and the pitch to the moment you put your signature on, on the agreement? Two to three months. I must say it has been a phenom phenomenal experience. I've learned a lot. Uh, they're brand builders. Um, they have that long-term view, contrary to what people say. Uh, they want to invest. They want to make the brands better and better performing. And, and Brighton will be better in a couple of years than uh, when we took it over. What about sources of inspiration? I mean, your father was a jeweler. When you look back at your upbringing and your early days, who helped drive the motivation that you have today? You have to walk through life with open eyes. You know, you, you, you just open your eyes. Look at the car industry. Uh, what are the color codes? How is it uh, developing? What kind of leather do they use? What kind of designs? What are the trends? What is going on in fashion? What is going on in arts and in, in the film industry? And I, got, I get inspiration from all these areas, and uh, as do my colleagues. Did your parents give you any particular of key course. piece of advice? No, of course. When you, I mean, I'm raised, I was raised in this environment, um, and you get a certain um, uh, relation to it. You get a certain feeling uh, when, when you're constantly surrounded by jewelry or, or art, and you get a, you get a, yes, you get a feeling. But that's, that's something, um, it's, it's very difficult to teach if, uh, if you want also at university. It's something you, you need to have inside of, of, uh, of you and, and try to develop it and, um, uh, with time. Could you do me a favor and look at your watch for a second? Yeah. When you look at it, what comes to mind? Beauty, performance, and... Uh, a specific style. Is it charged with any memories? Is it is it special to you, or is this sort of a day-to-day? Yeah, it's, it's very watch? special to me because it's a huge. Uh, it's it's a it's a product we just launched, and it's a huge success. So it's very special. Now for a quick fire round. If you weren't the CEO of a Swiss watch company today, what would you be doing? I would be in the movie business, most probably. Actually, I am because I just produced a movie in, in France. How much is an average Breitling going to cost? Um, an average today, it's 5,700 US dollars. How long does it take for a Breitling to come to life? Two to three years. With advances in manufacturing and 3D printing, there are now super fakes. Can you tell a fake from an original? A colleague of you did that test to me a couple of years back. Thank God I didn't fail. <laughs> Does it worry you that there's so many fakes out there? No, because people buying fakes are not our clientele anyway. How do you relax and unwind? Skiing in winter, okay. cycling in summer. Describe your leadership style in three words. I would say passionate. Um, I would say clear leadership. And um, I would even say delegation. What is one thing that you still want to do that you haven't done yet? I'm quite a happy man right now. So nothing left on your bucket list at this point? I mean, you always want to do better and bigger and you do a new movie and do another deal and do this and that. But uh, I think I've been very lucky in my life until now. George, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.